arm in arm. This, this is, is Cleveland's, Cleveland's team, team, a baseball, baseball history podcast. podcast. A regular, a regular look, look back, back at professional, professional baseball, baseball in Cleveland, Cleveland from 1901 and beyond. Now, now here's, your, here's host, your host, Guardians, Guardians team, team historian, historian Jeremy, Jeremy Fedor. Fedor. Hey, Guardians fans. We are back with another podcast. On this week's episode, we chat with 1984 first-round pick Corey Snyder about his time in Cleveland. Hope you enjoy. That'll sync up the two when I go to the computer. And I have some stuff for you, too, just down with the jogs and memories with some photos. Okay. And, uh, you know, as we talk, I just kind of want to focus on your uh, your Cleveland time. And um, so I guess we'll get cool. started from there. Make sure it's still going. It's recording. Okay. So... One thing I guess I like to ask everyone is, when did, for you, did you realize that baseball was going to be your trajectory in life? Um, you know, I loved playing ball growing up. I think when it hit me that uh, I like to do this is uh, my dad took me to a Dodger game when I was a kid. And uh, he recalls us watching the game, and I didn't say a word of the whole game. And he was like, after the game, he was like, did you enjoy that? You didn't say a word, you just watched the game. And I'm like, I turned to him and he goes, he turned to me and he's like, you know, I think I can do this. And that's when I realized, you know what, I love baseball. Um, I was probably 14 at the time. And who'd you look up to then as a you know a young baseball fan? Who were the guys you were watching and paying attention to? Um, I mean, we lived in L.A., so I mean, went to the Dodger games all the time. So, I mean, so I used to watch, you know, Garvey and you know, Lopes and Say and, you know, Russell and all those guys and stuff like that. I used to watch, uh, you know, Reggie Smith a lot in the outfield, things like that. But uh, I just, um, just in general, just loved the game of baseball. Um, I didn't worry about uh, really who was playing or what was going on. I just liked the game itself. So Cleveland was so far off your radar then. Uh, did you know that Cleveland was looking at you as a possible uh, draft pick? I had no idea. I just knew that, uh, you know, I had three good years and it was, you know, time to, to move to the next chapter of my life and uh, hopefully that was going to be, you know, in pro ball somewhere. So I just had no idea. We were just home and all of a sudden you get a call. Do you remember who called you or what that was like or is that all a blur? I mean, that's quite a bit. Um, if I had to remember, I think um, it was a scout that was around at the time. Um, I'm trying to think. It could have been Eddie Bain who's been around the game forever. I think he gave me a call, and I can't remember if he came to my house or I think there was a guy named Gary Sutherland that was around at the time as well. But I know Eddie Bain was a big uh, big part of me signing with Cleveland. Um, now, most guys have asked, you know, nowadays when you get drafted in the first round, you're brought to the ballpark, you know, it's during the show one round. You actually kind of got to come to the ballpark with uh, looking at that picture over there. It mentioned that there was like a barnstorming tour with the – U.S. team that you were a part of. Um, was that your first time, A, in Cleveland and B, in the ballpark? Guaranteed. Guaranteed. Yeah, it was kind of, uh, you know, that tour of the Olympic team was pretty cool. I mean, it was, we hit like 33 different cities in like 40 days. I mean, it was hectic. But it was cool when we were able to come through here and I was able to, you know, do this picture. And um, first time in Cleveland ever. Um, first time in the ballpark. So it was, uh, I mean, it was fun and exciting. It was just kind of cool doing the tour and be able to come through a city that uh, you were just drafted by. And, you know, Cleveland Municipal Stadium was uh, was quite a bit different from Dodger Stadium, obviously. Um, did, do you remember any sort of uh, recollections coming through there, being on that field, feeling how massive that ballpark was? Um, that was probably the first thing that hit you, is how big it was and how many people could get actually fit in that stadium. Um, it just seemed, uh, it just, when you're going around... You know, as a kid out of college, it's just a big league ballpark. You know, you don't really look at it as, you know, a cool place or not a cool place. You just know, hey, you know, this is the big leagues right here. So it was just um, probably of all the stadiums we hit, it was probably the biggest stadium that we played in during the summer. But um, it was still pretty cool to come through here. Do you recall if there were any teammate, uh, you know, Cleveland players that, you know, hey, our number one draft picks here, anyone come up? Did you get to check out? Uh, anyone? Um, not really. Not really. It wasn't as big as it is today where they make a huge deal out of it. They bring him in. They have a huge press conference. They hit BP. They do that whole thing. We were just kind of coming through here. 
um, played an exhibition game, but um, I didn't really remember meeting really anybody until the following spring training when I went to Big League camp. And that, that 84 team was pretty stacked. I saw McGuire was on it. I think Will Clark was on there, too. That must have been a pretty, uh, you know, especially as their careers went on, to say you played with Mark McGuire and, and those guys. I mean, uh, besides being the, the whirlwind of a tour, any other memories from that uh, besides the 33, 40 days? We had, uh, I mean, we had, we had some fun guys on that team, like you mentioned. You know, we had Mark McGuire, which I ended up actually working with him uh, we threw BP to each other in the off season. He lived in Costa Mesa, I lived in Laguna. So we'd meet at UC Irvine. So, um, but it was, I mean, it was a fun tour. Um, just kind of getting to know each other. I mean, we were traveling so crazy that, uh, I mean, we were, we were pretty tired through the whole thing. I mean, we finally got to the all-star game in San Francisco that year. And, uh, it was like, oh, we're actually in one place for three straight days. And it was like heaven. But, uh, but it, I mean, it was, it was fun. It was good uh, doing some things. I got to know a few of them. Um, I played the Pan American Games in 83 in Venezuela. So we got to know them uh, there. But it was cool just kind of uh, getting to know each guy a little more personally um, and then watching them be drafted and then watching them kind of through their career. Um, and it was, uh, it was pretty cool. Does something like that? help prepare you I guess to, to get in the major leagues I mean you're playing uh, division one baseball anyway but um, yeah I imagine a, a tour like that with with superstar players you know has to be somewhat helpful oh guaranteed I mean it's just you know when you're <clears throat> I mean I was at BYU we were D1 but the travel wasn't even close to where it was so just going from park to park you know and the buses and the airplanes and things like that it, it did you you know get you going um, kind of got you prepared some, um, but then you go back to the minor leagues for a year or so. <laughs> you know, you're back to the buses again, but um, it, it, it does prepare you just for, you know, when you get there, it's like, okay, now you got to get yourself mentally prepared. you got to get ready for the game. you got to start focusing on certain things. So um, it was somewhat of a preparation, uh, and I, I enjoy that part of it. And your time in the, the minors for Cleveland, I guess relatively speaking, wasn't that long. Was that something that – you know, you could see Cleveland was kind of in this weird flux, I think, of, you know, they were hadn't had success for a while, and obviously in hindsight, you know, turned 1990-plus, they had that success. But was there some way you could see that there was a path for you to get up quickly? or You know, it's just, it was weird. I didn't really think, I mean, I know it's different these days, where it's just they, they have a path and they want you there at a certain period of time, but um, I was just in pro ball. I was playing. I mean, my I was over 22 to start out my pro career in Double A, and I look back at it and it's like it didn't even bother me. It's like I'm in pro ball. It doesn't matter what happens now. I just got to keep playing and play hard. Um, so uh, nowadays the guys, you know, they move around a lot. They move up. They move down. They move all these different places. Where back then it was like you when you go to Double A, you're going to be there all year. So I assumed I was going to be there. I wasn't even looking to be called up. I just, you know, I'm playing double-A baseball, and we'll see what happens. So I just kind of went out and played. And um, the next year I ended up going to, to Maine for, for a couple months, and then back I was up. So um, I just I didn't worry too much about going up or down or what was happening. I was just enjoying playing the game of baseball, um, something that I love to do, and uh, just let it take it where it was going to. Now, do you remember that uh, moment when you got the news you're going to be called up in '86? Yeah, it was uh, after the game. Um, I was actually we had a little one bedroom apartment, me and my wife then uh, in Old Orchard Beach, Maine. Called me on the phone and said, "Hey, you're going to the big leagues tomorrow," and it was, I mean, huge for me, exciting for me. Um, said you're leaving tomorrow morning at 8:30, so it was kind of like a crazy night, not much sleep. Um, a lot of packing, a lot of getting ready, um, but uh, it was uh, it was pretty cool um, to be able to show up here. I mean, you know, Brett Butler was one of my best friends. Joe Cardo was a great friend. So, you know, knowing those guys coming up here, it wasn't like it was that scary. You just kind of they kind of took me under their wing in spring training for that for that year and said, you know, you'll be up by here, and you know what, we'll take care of you. So it was kind of kind of a you know a fun, exciting little homecoming to uh, to see those players again. Yeah. It's funny how so much of this has changed with Twitter and social media. That news is just so instantaneous, and 
you know, you're able to get family and friends in town. And I can't imagine your family in California was able to get up to Cleveland in a moment's notice to see you play or did it take them a while? No, they, um, I mean, it was like overnight. So um, literally my wife was there. I literally took the flight. I had her get her a flight. And instead of her coming here, because we were only going to be here three days. But what was cool, we were here for three days. Then we did the West Coast Swing. So my, our families are both in California. So it worked out good to where I was just here by myself for the three days. Then we went to Seattle. Uh, my dad was able to fly up, and uh, he spent three days in Seattle with me um, to watch those games, which is cool. Then he went home, and then we went to Oakland um, for three, and then down to uh, Anaheim and uh, played the Angels down there. And then everybody was there. So it was kind of kind of cool that, you know, I made the big leagues, and, you know, within a week or so, um, all the family and friends were able to come out and, and watch me play. And do you recall your uh, your first major league hit? First major league hit was here. Um, first night against Burt Bly Eleven, it was a triple off the right field wall. Um, those are the those are the things you don't really ever forget. And uh, it was fastball up and away, and uh, I was able to get to it and hit it off the wall. So it was good. It was about a foot almost from going out. So uh, it was good. Was it when Bert got into the Hall of Fame? Was that kind of exciting? Then you could say your first hit was off a. Uh, it was cool. <laughs> it was cool. I kind of, you know, I mean, I, I hit a home run in Fenway against Tom Seaver. So I mean, these guys get in, and it's it's cool to say, you know, hey, you got some hits off some Hall of Famers. Um, it was good. I think I hit a home run off of uh, Randy Johnson a well in Seattle. So uh, when these guys get in, it's kind of cool to say, you know, you get some. Got some pretty good hits against some Hall of Famers. And then do you remember your first home run two days after that? Two days after that, Frank Viola down the left field line. Yeah, I remember that one too. Now, nowadays, you know, it's it's a frantic, go get that ball, and then do you still have those baseballs? Or? I still have them all. I, uh, I have uh, one little case that I have of, you know, all of my first, you know, first home run, first hit. Um, I have a lot of, uh, you know, Hall of Fame guys signed baseballs. Um, what's cool is every baseball I have in there I actually got signed personally. It was cool when we were in the you know in the 80s. It was really cool um, because they used to have the Hall of Fame games. So we would sit in the dugout with you know DiMaggio and you know Ernie Banks and just talk baseball, and we'd run up and you know get in. It's just it's a different game, but back then it was just like we respected these guys for what they did and they paved the way for us and um, it's it's a little different these days I don't think they really even know who played before them it's all about uh, you know what's going on now but um, there were just some really good players and, and we enjoyed that um, just sitting in the dugout and just talking baseball was was really fun does that ever seem, I guess, surreal? I mean, the idea of, of you know, oh, just hanging out with DiMaggio and Ernie Banks. I mean, it had to have been like a pinch me kind of moment. Oh, guaranteed. I mean, you're kind of in it to the moment, but it's like this guy right here is going to be a Hall of Famer someday. You know what I mean? And it's like you want to get as much information and just sit and chat, you know, chat with them. We had a lot of them. We'd have a lot of them going through New York and Chicago, and uh, we would just sit and just talk to these players. Um, just about the game of baseball. I mean, I guess it's, it's been a while, but is there anything you can remember that stuck with you? Or, I mean, or was there well, talking to these guys, any advice that they gave you that really, you know, or was it just ca casual kind of conversations? And like, oh, that was neat and went on with your time. I mean, most time it was casual, but um, I mean, it just, I remember Ernie Banks just talking about, you know what, every day you come to the ballpark, enjoy what you're doing. You know what I mean? It's a great game. Someday you'll get caught up in the business end of it. But right now, when you're on the field, you got a uniform that you can put on every single day. Enjoy every single day. Um, because there's not many people that get a chance to do this. In that first game, again, you had played at the ballpark, you know, under different circumstances, but do you recall just being in the outfield and what was that like to, to stand out there as a member of the professional Cleveland team in, in 1986 as a a uh, 20 some odd year old kid um i mean it was just i mean it was like it was real but it didn't really hit you that you're actually here in the big leagues doing what you always wanted to do as a kid um so it, it probably took a couple weeks for it to really sink in i think that first road trip to la um, when i was in anaheim it probably sunk in probably a little more 
when your family and their friends are coming up after the game and it's like you really did make this you know what I mean so but it was just um it was a cool homecoming for me just coming here just because with Brett Butler and Joe Carter and Mel Hall and I mean Pat Tabler and all those guys you know that I played with in spring training were here so it was kind of um, fun to come up and and just kind of mix it in with those guys so they made it a little bit easier so it wasn't the the big shock factor as you know you're finally in the big leagues it was kind of like okay you're home now let's go so it was cool and I guess I was going to ask if you know someone took you under their wing but it sounds like you already had a good core of guys that were here that you'd played with in passing that uh, kind of showed you the ropes it was good you know I mean Brett Butler and Joe Cotter were probably my best friends going through Cleveland I mean, we'd, uh, I mean, we play cards together. We play golf together. Um, it, it was just, I mean, Brett Butler's little girls were probably at our house in spring training more than they were at his house. We just, we hit it off really well. We're still good friends to today. Um, but it was just, it was nice when you have down to earth um, friends and players that kind of take you under the wing and say, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you the ropes. This is what we do. This is where we go. This is what we do. Um, but it was, uh, I mean, it was fun. I mean, it was kind of like you're in the big leagues now and you got to wear this, you got to wear that. So I think, um, to be honest, I think my first time shopping for big league clothes was with uh, Brett Butler's um, wife, Eveline. I think she took me shopping and said, okay, this is what you got to wear in the big leagues now. So I'm just wearing jeans and just a T-shirt. So we had to start dressing up and wearing sport coats. So, um, but it was, it was a fun time. Yeah, and speaking of that old ballpark, there were times where, you know, you could have 60,000. I know this one paper, actually, this is from your debut, 61,000 at your uh, debut. So I don't know if that warps your view of, hey, Cleveland's great. There's 60,000 <laughs> fans here. Then the next night there might be 4,000. Do you remember, um, you know, some guys mentioned you're able to hear, you were able to hear fans pretty easily when it was sparse crowds and being in the outfield. Um, you know, is that kind of a unique situation where you bounce around numbers-wise like that? It was. It's kind of. Uh, I mean, it was. It was a weird dynamic. I mean, the first night, that Friday night, um, was just crazy because there were so many people here. But it's it just like the old movie. It's just when you are there, it's cool to see them. But when you're on deck, when you get to the plate, you don't hear them anymore. It's just like the focus is in on. Hey, this is the pitcher. This is what we got to do. I got to do my job now. Um, but but when you're in the outfield. I mean, it's cool having all the fans yelling, just screaming at you. You know what I mean? You're waving, you're throwing balls to them. So, I mean, it's a cool dynamic. Um, some nights you kind of have to yell at the, uh, you know, vendors to keep it down a little bit because <laughs> you can hear everything. It was funny sometimes. You know, we get home after a game, we win a game, and it's like we know how many fans were there. And literally at night on TV you see the same fans. They scan the same fans so it looks like – there's a whole bunch of fans there, but uh, but it was just um, I mean the the fans have been really good here in Cleveland. They've been great fans. I mean I still see some of them now when I come back there and it's great. Um, but um, there's just uh, it was just kind of one of those things. You're just happy to be in the big leagues, and uh, I think we got you know we got some really good crowds a lot of times. You know, I'm one of those fans that uh, recently lost was John Adams. Did you have a relationship with John? Or do you remember, you know, the first time hearing the drum and going, what is, is that going on out there? I mean, Yeah, he was, uh, he was there every game. You know that is. But uh, it was kind of cool. I never really got to meet him. But, um, I mean, it was sad when, uh, when he was gone. But um, it was kind of cool. It was, it was, you know, tradition. Everybody knew that's what you were going to hear when they came to, you know, Cleveland Stadium. And uh, but it was uh, it was cool. What was your favorite ballpark as you once you got started to get into? Was it going to Fenway? I have to. I just think Fenway would be the, one of the most remarkable places to play. I mean, what was it like to go to Old Yankee Stadium and Tiger Stadium and things like that? Um, you know, probably. I mean, Yankee Stadium was great. Um, it was sad when they tore it down, just because standing in the box, knowing the guys that stood in this box was really cool. I mean, it just was, was really cool. Um, Fenway was awesome. Old Comiskey was awesome. Um, I played uh, in the Cape Cod League in 83, and our all-star game was in Fenway. So that was the first time I got to play in Fenway, so I just fell in love with Fenway, and I just felt comfortable. I saw the ball well there, um, so I seemed to uh, to hit uh, hit pretty good there. I had those, you know, 
high towering home runs, so they got over that wall pretty easy. So it was good. But I, I enjoyed it. Just the atmosphere of Fenway. It's just, I mean, it was great. I mean, it just, uh, you know, like we talked earlier about fans. I mean, it was cool being on the road, even though they were getting on you and ragging on you. It was cool going somewhere where it was a packed house. Just playing, you know, in front of people was, was really cool. And with the old stadium, too, towards the end of uh, the season and Brown season starting, did you ever have any issues with the outfield being, you know, half football, half baseball, or anything of that? Do you recall that being um, a pretty issue? Just a couple times. A couple times when you go out in the right field, I was like, holy cow, what happened here? I mean, it just got trampled. But um, most of the time, most of the time it wasn't too bad. But, um, yeah, I mean, you just you knew it was going to happen. It was just kind of one of those things. And... Some guys have a reason for wearing their number. Was yours just given to you and you stuck with it, or did you pick your number for a reason? Um, you know, I, I wore 27 in college. And then when I came uh, to the Indians, I mean, I wanted um, 27, but somebody was wearing 27. Mel Hall was wearing 27. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to have, I'm going to get the closest number to 27. So they gave me 28, and um, it kind of stuck with me, and I lucked out. Everywhere I played, I was able to get that same number. So um, it was just kind of one of those things that, uh, you know, kind of stuck with me. Uh, my boys were 28 all the way going through. I think my boys still wear it now. So um, it was just kind of one of those things that kind of stuck with me. And for you, was Municipal a great hitting park? Or did, was it something that you just, I mean, it was your home park, but did you enjoy hitting there? Or did you wish you kind of had some walls that were in a little closer? Um, it would have been better. I mean, it was a big ballpark. I mean, you had to hit the ball to get it out of there. So, I mean, there are some ballparks on the road that were a little bit easier to get out of there. I mean, Baltimore was great. Fenway was great. I mean, Yankee Stadium right field was great. So, um, but, you know, again, I, I didn't worry about it too much. I was in the big leagues playing, so I mean, he hit a home run, he hit a home run. I mean, down the lines wasn't too bad, but when you start getting to the gaps, you got to be able to get on that ball pretty good. It was a pretty big ballpark. And you mentioned, you know, baseball greats and legends you've got to meet. Um, do you have any stories with Bob Feller? I know he was around a bit, especially during spring training. Did you get to know Bob well? I did. You know, Bob was a um, really good friend. I mean, great person. I just love to sit down and talk with him. You know, he was always uh, at fantasy camp, you know, and he would just sit and just do, you know, just talk to the to, to campers. Uh, most of us would stay around just to hear his stories. And um, he was just a fun guy. He had stories, um, unbelievable person. Um, so it was just enjoyable just to sit around and just talk baseball because he had so many stories and he would talk for hours just about baseball and about what he was uh, what he was all about. So it was pretty cool. Um, trying to think of what else. Yeah, some guys, you know, Bob was just such a staple of, of Cleveland's baseball history. And um, another staple of our history is, is Bobby D. What was he like to work with? Any good stories about Bobby uh, that you know, I can take back with me? And, uh... Bobby D. <laughs> you know, Bobby D. has been a friend forever. And it's just, it's amazing. Um the person he is and the person he's been all these years he just he cares about you as a person and cares about your family probably more than anything um, he'll do anything for any one of us at any time for our families and things like that so he just been a uh, just a fun guy to be around um, I think I played golf with him a couple times he can swing it pretty good but uh, Bobby just down to earth um, just love the guy and uh, I think it comes down to, you know, it's not what we do here or what we do for him. It's just he just cares about you and your family so much that you'll do anything possible. When he just says, hey, I need you to do this, you want to do it for him. He's just a uh, great uh, down-to-earth person. One thing I loved about having these, the guys from the 80s in is, you know, Major League, it wasn't necessarily filmed here, but there were certain parts. Do you recall the game where they did the overhead helicopter? Scott Bales was mentioning he was kind of hanging out, waving to it. I don't know if uh, you know, Bobby said, I think a lot of you guys had to go to the dugout and kind of hide. Do you remember a lot of that stuff? I remember them coming around. I think there was a few, um, a few of the actors that were kind of here. We kind of met a few of them. Um, but we were, I remember that night. Helicopter coming over, doing all that. I know it was filmed in Milwaukee, um, but we actually uh, we actually got to see the premiere of it when we were in Chicago. I think it was after a Sunday night game. We all went in and actually saw the premiere before it came out, so it was kind of cool. So it was, 
I mean, it's funny. Everybody asks, always asks us about it. And it's like, well, it was cool. It wasn't really filmed there. They didn't really know that. I mean, we knew where it was in, you know, County Stadium there. But, um, I mean, it, it was a cool thing to kind of be a little bit a part of that. Would have been cool if it would have, you know, happened that way one of those years. But uh, we kind of knew the team we had, and we knew we were a little short. And uh, But it was still fun to be kind of a part of that uh, part of that movie. And, you know, you mentioned kind of coming up short towards – and then towards the end of your tenure, like – it slowly starts to build for Cleveland. On the 1990 team, your last year in Cleveland, you know, Carlos Bayerga was popping up, Albert and Nagy. Do you remember, you know, seeing those guys and thinking, you know, hey, there might be something special coming up, or it's kind of hard to tell with young guys. It could be great one year and, you know. Oh, man, I, mean, I knew those guys that were coming up were going to be really, really good. I mean, they were good players. Um, I knew we were getting close. I think all those years, I mean, I can't remember for sure, but we averaged, you know, five or six runs a game and still lose a lot of games. I think we were just a little bit of short pitching-wise. Pitching is everything. Mm-hmm. doesn't matter, you know, what level you're at. Pitching is everything in the game of baseball. And we either, either you know, a little, you know, a couple relievers short or, you know, a couple starters short. We had some good pitching. But when they get through a few of those, then all of a sudden we got these other guys coming in and, um, it was just kind of one of those things where these new guys that were coming up were uh, were pretty fun. Pretty fun to watch in spring training when they were coming up. They were just You knew they were going to be really good. Um, to be honest, I was hoping to spend my whole career here. Um, but when you get, for some reason, in Cleveland back then, when you get to your fifth year, just before your free agent year, um, they just kind of they, they trade you away. Um, it was a sad day for me. Because I love Cleveland, I love the people here. Um, I wanted to play here for a long time, but uh, it's it's baseball, and you get caught up in the business part of it sometime. And that's kind of what happened. So that was in the back of your mind then. You knew coming up, like, hey, it's my fifth year. Like, they're not talking extensions or anything. You knew it was kind of yeah. You pretty much knew when you go home in the off season that something was going to happen. It happened to Joe Carter. Happened to Brett Butler. I mean, it's just. It was just one of those things that you just knew that, you know, this is your fifth year, it's going to be a free agent year, so something is probably going to happen. And it, it usually did, which uh, which was sad, you know, but it's the business part of it, and that's what they needed to do. And, uh, I mean, now you look back and say, okay, I get it. But it would have been fun to have all those players for another two or three years here to see what what we really could have done, which is what they did mid-'90s. Um, they had some good teams. They, you know, kept some players around, and uh, it was it was fun to watch. And what was it like to play with Tito? Tito was uh, he was fun. He just, I mean, he was fun in the clubhouse. Um, very hard nosed. Played the game right. Played the game hard. Um, being around the game with his dad for so long, I mean, you just you knew he was going to be good. Um, but uh, it, it was just it was enjoyable to. Uh, to play with him and just kind of watch, you know, he'd been around the game for so long. You kind of watch different players to see, you know, what they're all about and how do they handle themselves and how do they, you know, do things at the plate. And, and you try to learn something from every one of those guys that have been around the game. And um, it was enjoyable to uh, to play with him and just kind of see how he handled himself. And um, to be honest, it doesn't shock me what's, you know, a good manager he's become um, just because it's just, I think the players – respect him more than anything as he knows how to handle the veterans and also the young kids that come up. Um, they just know how much he cares about them, probably off the field as much as he does on the field. And when you can get a manager that cares about you that much, he's like a Tommy Lasorda, um, you know, things like that, 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 that really uh, want, you, want you to do well. You know what I mean? It's hard, that fine line as a manager you know, knowing how to, you know, take care of your players, how to do certain things. But um, Tito's done an unbelievable job. He did a great job in Boston where, you know, it was great. But um, he's done some really, really good things here. And you were part of that team that was 88 that had the, you know, I think it was five different managers from that club. I mean, again, it's easy to say, oh, look back and what do you think? You, does that make sense that, you know, Bud Black, a human manager, that um, Ron Washington, uh, Charlie Manuel is on the team. Um, but I, I don't know. I'm sure you've been asked that already, but I mean, is it surprising, I guess, or is it, you know, looking back in retrospect, it's easy to see, or? Um, I mean, I, like Buddy Black, I mean, he's a good friend. 
Um, I think he's done a really good job, but he just um, you, you watch players and you know which ones are smart, and you can see as managers. Um, I mean, Charlie was just. I mean, I, I to be honest, I couldn't see Charlie as a manager because he was so carefree and just loved teaching hitting. But when he became a manager, he was unbelievable. And it's just, I mean, he's really, really smart. Um, but when he talks, it's so down to earth that you're like, holy cow, this guy did a really good job. Um, so, I mean, Johnny Farrell, you just, you knew he was going to do something in baseball. And uh, you just see these players, and then it's just, they think, and they're ahead of other people more than, you know, the normal guy. Because you're just, you're focusing on baseball, playing the game, and that's kind of what you do. But you kind of saw in these guys, you know, later in the game that they'd probably have a chance to, uh, to move on and do something. Do you ever get tired of signing Sports Illustrated? The, the uh, what's the 89 one that came out? 87. 87. 87. That, uh, is that something that you've, it's run its court? I mean, is that just, hey, you're on the cover of Sports Illustrated. You know, how many people can say that? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't ever get tired of it. I mean, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm one that is, you know what, I've been blessed to play this game. And if, if I'm asked to sign something, you know what, I'm more than happy to sign something. So I've signed thousands of them. I still get them in the mail. Oh, wow. And it's crazy after all these years and stuff like that. But um, it's kind of cool to say, you know, you're on the cover of Sports Illustrated at one time. So it was pretty uh, pretty cool to say that. So it doesn't uh, doesn't bother me a bit when somebody wants me to sign it. Do you have that in your house framed or anything? I've got it framed. Right. Yeah, I've got it framed in my house. You know, my den. You know, the wife gives you one room, <laughs> <laughs> so I'll put my memorabilia up in one room. So, but I uh, for sure have that signed. It's it's pretty cool. Well, Nate just came back in. I think we're at a good stopping point because you have to throw out a first pitch today. So thank you again for uh, you got the it. Chat. No that problem. Was a lot of fun. Um, one thing. Before You've been listening to Cleveland's Team, a baseball history podcast with Guardians team historian Jeremy Fedor.